everyone! In today's video, I'm just going to quickly go through circadian, infradian and ultradian rhythms. So first off, it's important to understand what is actually involved with our biological rhythms. So, all biological rhythms are governed by our endogenous pacemakers, which are your body's internal biological clocks, and an exogenous zeitgebers, which are any external changes in the environment. So first of all, we're going to look at circadian rhythms. So circadian rhythms are rhythms that last for about 24 hours, and the most common ones we see within our body are the sleep-wake cycle and the cycle of core body temperature. In this video, we're mostly just going to cover the sleep-wake cycle. So the exogenous zeitgeber for the sleep-wake cycle is light. So when it becomes light, our body knows that we need to wake up. And when it's dark, our body gets sleepy. So an important question to ask here is, without light, would the endogenous pacemaker still know when to wake up slash when to feel sleepy? So the main question here is, without light, would the endogenous pacemaker still know when to wake up slash feel sleepy? And so Seif aimed to investigate this using his cave study. So what Seif basically done was he went into a cave for two months to test the effects it had on his own biological rhythm. And then when he was a bit older, he done it again, but this time for six months. And what this done was it meant that there was no light affecting Seif's biological rhythm. So he actually found that his free running biological rhythm settled at a time just short of 25 hours. And the reason this was so key is that it showed that without the exogenous zeitgeber of light, our body clock is still able to maintain a somewhat regular cycle, with of course a regular cycle being 24 hours. And there has also been some other research that has been conducted, just testing to see whether Seif's study can be replicated. So Ashoff and Weaver sent a group of participants to a World War II bunker where they had no natural light. They found that all but one of the participants displayed similar results to that of Seif, whereby they had a biological rhythm of about 24 to 25 hours. And so what these results were key in showing is that our sleep-wake cycle is probably just over 24 hours, but the exogenous zeitgebers are useful in entraining this to just the 24 hours within a day. But of course, in usual psychology style, we do have a however point to consider. So, this researcher showed that the influence of environmental cues should not be overestimated. So 12 people agreed to stay in a cave across a period of three weeks, going to bed at a set time, which was indicated by a clock, and waking up at a set time, again shown by the clock. As the study progressed, the researchers gradually sped up the clock without telling the participants, so that their day lasted for only 22 hours as opposed to the normal 24 hours. However, they found that only one of the participants was fully able to adjust to this. This therefore suggests that the free-running biological clock is able to override some external changes in the environment. And now here we've just got some AO3 points that fit the studies that we've just gone through. So of course, you've got a negative point, a limitation is that there is the use of case studies. And of course, as we know, case studies generally lack generalizability. And Seif's biological clock was slower in his later study, and this was presumably because he was older. And this is important because it shows that Seif's first study was not even generalised to himself when he conducted the study again later on. And then of course you've also got the fact that all of the studies discussed here only use small sample sizes. However, a key strength of these studies is that they have good practical application to shift work. So this is because these studies have clearly shown the effects of disruption to biological rhythms. So for example, it's been found that we have poorer concentration at around 6 a.m. This is known as a circadian trowel. And then this is also where accidents are more likely to happen. Therefore, it's important for shift workers to note this and to know when they should be taking their breaks. There's also been a relationship between shift work and poor health. And finally, another strength is that there is also good practical application to drug treatments. 
and this is because research into these biological rhythms have shown when the peak times are where drugs are most likely to be effective. And this means that people are now aware of when the best time is to take their medication. Next, we've got infradian rhythms. And an infradian rhythm is a rhythm that takes more than 24 hours to complete. So an example of an infradian rhythm is the menstrual cycle, which takes approximately 28 days to complete. And there are many different hormones involved. So Stern and McClintock conducted a study showing that menstrual cycles may synchronise with each other because of female pheromones. So in order to show this, they gathered pheromones from nine women and rubbed this on the lip of 29 participants. They found that 68% of their participants experienced changes to their own cycle, making them more in line with that of the pheromone donor. Another infradian rhythm is the seasonal affective disorder, shortened to SAD. So this is a depressive disorder with a seasonal pattern of onset. So we typically see this within the winter months when there is less hours of daylight. The main symptoms are similar to depression and include persistent low mood and a general lack of activity. So melatonin is produced during the night up until there is an increase in light levels. The secretion of melatonin inhibits the production of serotonin and both melatonin and serotonin are hormones within the body. Lower serotonin levels have been linked with depressive symptoms and then this is just a side point that researchers aren't actually sure if lower serotonin levels lead to depression or if depression leads to lower serotonin levels. Next we've got ultradian rhythms and one of the most researched ultradian rhythms is the sleep cycle. And this is generally looked at using EEGs. Stage 1 and 2 of the sleep cycle is more commonly known as the sleep escalator. During this stage, a person is easily woken, but their brain waves become slower as sleep deepens. And these are their theta waves. Stages 3 and 4 is also known as slow wave sleep. There are delta waves here, which become even slower. At this stage, it's very difficult to wake the sleeper. And finally, you've got stage five, which is the rapid eye movement stage of sleep. During this stage, the body is paralyzed, yet brain activity begins to speed back up again. And the random eye movements are associated with dreaming. Now moving on to the AO3. So a limitation is that there's problems with synchronization studies. One of these problems is methodological issues. So these include the presence of confounding variables that may also have an impact on the menstrual cycle. For example, factors such as stress and changes in diet. There is also some contradictory research here as well. So this researcher conducted a similar study to the one before and found no synchronization between women with their menstrual cycle Another AO3 point is about the evolutionary basis of the cycle. So this first part is a key strength of Stern and McClintock's study because it says that it's advantageous to have the same cycle as women would fall pregnant around the same time and so babies could be cared for as a group. However, this perspective has been questioned. E.g. this researcher here said that if women were all in sync there would be competition for the best males. And so this perspective says that it actually would have been more beneficial to have cycles at different stages and at different times. And so one final AO3 point is that there is good supporting evidence of the distinct stages of sleep. So Dermont and Kleitzmann observed nine participants in a sleep lab where confounding variables were controlled as much as possible. They found that the random eye movement stage was correlated with dreaming and participants woken when dreaming had a good recall of their dreams. This therefore clearly supports the idea that dreaming happens during the random eye movement stage. And then just another point here, that replications of this sleep lab have also had similar findings. And if you wanted to, you could go and find some examples of your own of these replications. So hopefully this video has been useful in showing you what the different rhythms are, as well as some studies to support them and some AO3 points to go alongside them also.